Today we're going to be focusing on COVID-19 and health inequalities and I'm going to be presenting some work from a recent book which I co-authored with Professor Julia Lynch from University of Pennsylvania and Professor Kathleen Smith from the University of Strathclyde. Next slide please. I'm going to talk about some of the inequalities that we've seen in COVID-19 with a particular focus on geographical inequalities and the northeast region. I'm then going to reflect a little bit on how we can put this in a more historical context, again looking at ha what happened during the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic and the regional inequalities within that. I'll then introduce the concept of a syndemic pandemic thinking about how we can think through the interactions between health inequalities and social inequality that existed before the pandemic and the impact that this might be having on COVID-19 outcomes at the moment. I'll then talk through some of the pathways which we've identified in the literature whereby we're finding inequalities in COVID-19. Next slide please. So this uh, chart is showing inequalities in COVID-19 at the neighbourhood level, looking at neighbourhood deprivation. We can see in the most deprived areas in the, in the blue bars is the COVID-19 rate, uh, mortality rate for people living in the 30% most deprived neighbourhoods. And we can see here that in those neighbourhoods, the mortality rate uh, during the first wave was around uh, twice as high as for people living in the least deprived neighbourhoods. So to put some context on this, uh, for example, for Scotland, then over the first year of the pandemic, the COVID-19 death rate was around 86 per 100,000 in the most deprived 20% of neighbourhoods. And that was double the sort of just under 40 in the least deprived. Next slide, please, Anne. Last week, you may have seen that we published a report with the Northern Health Science Alliance, which looked at the first year of the pandemic's impact on the Northeast and the rest of the North. And unfortunately, we found very high inequalities. And these maps here demonstrate at the local authority level, the mortality rate from COVID-19 and from all cause mortality over the first year of the pandemic. So rates we can see are particularly high in the urban areas of the northeast, the northwest, through to the North Midlands, and also in the London area. We also found an interaction between deprivation, as discussed in the previous slide, and region, regional inequalities as you can see on, on the map here. And what we found is that whilst the affluent areas in the south and the north had very similar um, all-cause and COVID-19 mortality rates, as you can see in this bar chart, deprived areas in the north had significantly higher mortality rates from COVID and from all-cause mortality than more deprived areas in the south of the country. So there's a, an impact of the north plus deprivation within the data that we've been analysing. Next slide please. Now some of these inequalities by region, by local authority and by neighbourhood have also been found in historical research looking at the last uh, massive global pandemic of over 100 years ago, the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic. Data from Norway, Sweden and the United States, for example, shows big inequalities in morbidity and mortality from Spanish flu. There's higher incidence of mortality amongst the working classes, for example, in Chicago, unemployed people in, in Sweden and at lower occupational groups, for example, from, in data from Oslo. In England, research had found big differences between urban and rural areas, as we also saw today. On, that, on the map I showed previously, mortality rates from Spanish flu were around 30 to 40% higher in more urban areas. Next slide, please. Together with um, a historian, Niall Johnson, and a geographer, um, Paul Norman from the University of Leeds, I recently did some work looking at what impact there was regionally in 1918. And as you can see on the map here, the mortality rates in 1918 were again much higher in the northern and the north of the Midlands and Wales than they were in the south and south central parts and East Anglia. So we see similar regional inequalities 100 years ago that our report also found for COVID-19 last week. In the table we can see some of the areas in 1918 that had the highest 
uh, mortality rates. And as you can see, Heaven and Jarrah in the northeast region had um, mortality rates around six times higher than some of the places in the more leafy and affluent areas, for example, of Surrey. So the inequalities we've seen in COVID-19 are what, replicating inequalities that we also saw regionally over 100 years ago. Next slide, please. Together with colleagues to try and understand these regional, local authority and neighbourhood inequalities in COVID-19, we use the concept of a syndemic to apply that across to the COVID-19 pandemic. The concept of syndemic comes from the anthropologist and clinician, Dr. Merrill Singer. He worked in, uh, in the 1990s looking at urban violence, HIV epidemics and drug epidemics in urban areas of the United States. And he argued that public health and health um, professionals should stop seeing these as separate epidemics, HIV violence, drug use, and to see how they're interacted with one another. And he used the concept of a syndemic to show how different epidemics can interact, influence and exacerbate each other. In this diagram, we apply this over, this idea of a syndemic over to the COVID-19 pandemic and try to show how different aspects of social inequalities interact with existing um, non-communicable diseases in order to produce inequalities in the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. From this idea of a syndemic, we can then think about at least four different pathways for inequalities, not just in COVID-19, but in other recent uh, infectious disease pandemics. Firstly, people living in more deprived neighbourhoods are more likely to be exposed to COVID-19 infection, for example, by having to continue to go into work while other people in more affluent occupations are able to work from home. Unequal transmission is another pathway. Once one member of the household is infected, then overcrowding, urban areas and a lack of ability to self-isolate due to low sickness payments can also mean that you're more likely to have transmission within a, a low-income neighbourhood household than in a more affluent one. On top of this, we can draw on theories and research done around seasonal flu to see that people in more deprived, um, from more deprived backgrounds are more susceptible to um, the adverse effects of an infectious disease. And so they're more likely to end up in hospital if they do contract the disease because of underlying um, problems with their immune system as a result of long-term exposure to, to, to the negative impacts of the social determinants of health. And the final main pathway is around unequal treatment. And this is particularly noticeable when you look at things like um, Ebola or Zika. But if we apply it across to COVID-19, then we can think about in the Northeast context, um, unequal distribution and access of the vaccine and uptake within our region, where we know that deprived neighbourhoods are less likely to be taking up the offer of the vaccine uh, than more affluent areas. And indeed, we can see this if we look more globally in terms of COVID-19, about who gets treatment uh, uh, in hospitals in countries where they don't have a universal health system like the NHS. Next slide, please. So this has been a bit of a whistle-stop lightning um, introduction to some of the work that we've been doing, led from Newcastle, on health inequalities in COVID-19. Our argument is that the health inequalities that affected the Northeast region before the pandemic are leading to this unequal pandemic in terms of the social determinants of health, but also in terms of the underlying non-communicable disease burden that we had in the region. All the research, all the social epidemiology is suggesting that COVID-19 outcomes are worse in more deprived communities. I've outlined some of the historical parallels and introduced very briefly the concept of a syndemic, which we could use to think through what action needs to be taken in the longer term for the region to reduce inequalities in NCDs and therefore reduce inequalities in any future infectious disease outbreaks. Thank you very much uh, for your attention and look forward to Tom's presentation and discussion. Brilliant, thanks Claire. Um, I did notice we had a hand up 
through that from Jane, but perhaps we would take those at the end if that's all right. Jane, oh, it was an accident. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> okay, I'm getting a nod there from her. Um, so, I mean, massive thanks to Claire, and um, she'll be available to, to answer any questions in a minute. And I think uh, Claire's really described the inequalities that have resulted um, from the pandemic in terms of COVID morbidity and mortality. And from my perspective, as a, a jobbing DPH in South Tyneside, I probably have a hundred graphs based on our local data that illustrate the same experience for the people of South Tyneside. Um, however, I'm, I'm not going to go through those, um, but perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm more going to offer some of my own personal reflections during this unprecedented period and think about how we may want to think about inequalities moving forward. I wanted to kind of perhaps give more of a narrative flavor and what it's felt like on the ground as a DPH and working within our local system. Um, to, to contrast with, with Claire's more academic perspective, but hopefully you'll see some of those parallels play through. So for those of you who aren't aware, South Tyneside has one of the most deprived populations in the country. Uh, we have about 150,000 people in the borough and we have widespread deprivation and child poverty, but we also have pockets of affluence as well in the borough. Um, so the in-borough inequalities are actually very broad too. Um, in my 2017 annual directors of public health report, I described two hypothetical lives of Jack and Emily. Now, Jack was born in Simonside and Reckondike, which is the most deprived ward in the borough. And Emily's born in Clean and East Bolden, which is the most affluent ward. Um, now, there's a, a 12 year life expectancy gap between these hypothetical children and an 18 year healthy life expectancy gap. And I tell you this because as soon as COVID-19 entered the UK and we began discussing the challenges that the pandemic would bring, we knew as a local system that the direct and indirect consequences of COVID would not be felt equally. We knew straight away that, that we would have an unequal pandemic and our most deprived communities would, would suffer the most. Um, so as a whole system, whether we're talking about health, housing, community support, the, the broader role of our businesses and the business sector, when we were working with those communities, we had inequalities at the forefront of our thinking uh, from, from day one, really, in terms of how we might respond. So in working closely with our schools, we were pushing hard to ensure that vulnerable children and families were supported by our excellent schools and making sure they had access to food, financial support, IT equipment and connectivity, digital connectivity. Our community hub model was reactive to people's circumstances and went well beyond um, supporting just the clinically extremely vulnerable. And we had council workers, volunteers, delivering food, medicines, putting money on people's meters so that they could pay for gas and electric. We, we really had quite a bespoke response, kind of leaving no one behind really over uh, well beyond kind of what our requirements were from central government. We designed our testing strategy to make it as accessible as possible, taking into account deprivation, making sure that our um, testing centers were in more deprived areas. We're making sure that we had walk-in models available as well. So it wasn't all relying on drive-in. We had targeted communications and messaging, making sure that we did whole borough mail outs and leaflet drops to make sure that every household was covered and that we weren't just relying on social media channels or, or, even, or even TV and radio, although we did those things as well. We put in place home visiting models to ensure that people with long-term conditions were supported at home. We had something called the SAT squad that were delivering um, vital oxygen saturation testing on people's doorsteps throughout the pandemic to make sure that we were taking services to people's individual homes. And we were lobbying at the regional level, the DPHs and the leaders in the region to make sure that we had informal childcare recognized within national guidance to allow parents to return to work. Because let's face it, not everyone can afford an Ofsted registered nanny, which was the way that the original guidance seemed to be written. Um, and then our vaccination program, again, from day one, we targeted inequalities from the start, trying to make sure that we took vaccines to people's homes. We were offering drop-ins rather than appointments. We were delivering in communities, near businesses, near community hubs, near faith settings to try and address um, some of those inequalities that we knew already existed and trying to make it as easy as possible to get access to the help and support that was needed. And with all of this, every metric we've analyzed since 
um, through an inequalities lens, takes that same gradient that Claire's already illustrated to you with people from more deprived communities experiencing poorer outcomes. So we noticed that throughout testing rates have been lower in more deprived communities, but positivity higher. So, you know, people weren't accessing testing for, for the various reasons that, that Claire's already described. We had case rates and hospitalizations that were higher in more deprived communities. The vaccine uptake is lower in more deprived communities and follows that, that perfect linear trend with higher uptake in more affluent areas. Now, uh, I don't mean to be depressing by telling you this, it's not meant to be, but it's really hit home to me that despite our response to a new situation with COVID obviously being a, a new and emergent pandemic that we were dealing with uh, from the beginning of 2020, we, in this situation, we had an opportunity to, to, to try and design in inequalities into our service type responses. So we developed a lot of our service responses from scratch. So we were able to say from the outset, we need to ensure that we have an unequal response here and target inequalities. And the inequalities gradient though, as a result of that has, has been sadly similar despite those best efforts. And for me, I feel like this reinforces that service responses on their own will not fix things. Um, there is a question to be to be answered around what might those might that inequalities gradient have been more stark if we hadn't taken this type of approach. I guess it's very hard to know, but ultimately we still have unfair outcomes as a result of this pandemic. Even more sadly, I guess we're only talking about the short term COVID impact. We haven't yet got onto the longer term employment, social, educational, health and social outcomes that we're starting to see through things like domestic abuse incidents mental health challenges, childhood weight is going to be a, a big emergent issue as a result of the pandemic, and children's social care referrals. And even that, even the early signs of those kind of issues, that it's early days on that. And, and unfortunately, we feel like the, those situations are going to get worse. So I, I believe that our local experience reinforces that if we don't do something at more systematic, regional, national level to address social, economic and health inequalities, we're always going to be on the back foot when it comes to even existing challenges as well as emergent challenges. Many of our communities, particularly in the north, do not have the safety nets in place um, and they continue to fall. So resilience simply isn't there to deal with the shocks and challenges that something like a pandemic poses. Many people with those safety nets beneath them don't always take uh, stock and stop and reflect on the role that those safety nets play whether that's a good job where you can work from home and you're guaranteed sick pay, a good house, savings or families that can help if you get into financial difficulties, a garden, a car or four, childcare and, and someone who can help on tap. Those sort of things that can um, start to be taken for granted, I guess. And I spent much of the pandemic reflecting on how challenging it was for me and my family personally, because I'm sure we all did feel extremely challenged through this period. But then then I started to think about the challenges and how they paled into insignificance when I thought about the hypothetical Jack from Simon's side and how living in a poor quality home with no garden, uh, a limited family support network, a mum that relies on shifts at the local supermarket that are infrequent or impossible to get to as she had no childcare, no car for shopping, no car for getting to work, therefore having to use public transport or car sharing, which as Claire's already said, increases her, her risk of exposure, no computer, no Wi-Fi. These are the sorts of different pandemics that people had that we, I don't feel like we've yet shined a light on. So at the local level, my challenge to the system and myself in many respects is how do we embed tackling inequalities in everything that we do at the local level through our work on regeneration, business development, transport, housing, digital expansion, education, we can't address inequalities through service specific responses. And I, I feel like the pandemics reinforced that. We have to think full system. I try and bring the hypothetical Jack into every conversation we have at the local level. However, the big challenge, and this is where the, the big ticket response is, is how do we do this at a regional and indeed national level? Using opportunities like collective work on local development structures, regional regeneration, things like the integrated care system and the, and the work that's happening uh, under the NHS and social care reforms. And reports like 
a year of COVID in the North and other Northern Science Alliance reports give us the evidence and the policy recommendations. I think the key challenge we've got is, is now how do we make inequalities the priority challenge as we move into the COVID recovery phase? Um, I feel like it's really difficult to understand why we accept the status quo with inequalities and deprivation. It's been evidenced over and over, whether it's through Marmot, Pickett, and, and more recent work on, on health inequalities. I feel like it's been evidenced over and over that uh, addressing inequalities actually benefits everyone, and, and everyone can be better off as a result of addressing inequalities in our society. So many respects, we need to make sure that all the ambassadors of change and stop in, regardless of what our roles are, and take the opportunity to stop and think about how something we're doing would affect the jacks of the world and how we can make things better for, for him in terms of his, his own circumstances in Simon Side and Reckondike, but therefore better for everyone. So they're, they're my kind of key reflections from the pandemic.